right and left and will continue. We are determined to take our country back and with God's help we will. Now I'd like to introduce to you someone who needs no introduction. Um, Mark Berry, someone who has taken the torch. Well, let me start back. I gave the torch to Jonathan Nelson, who in turn had a tea party July 4th. Jonathan, are you here? He's not. And Jonathan in turn handed it to Mark Berry. And Mark is doing a super job. Let's give him another hand. Thank you, Holly. Thank you very much. Uh, before I forget, we have a lot of uh, dignitaries and important people here. But uh, two very fiscal conservatives, conservative fiscal people, I suppose, are here, and I would like them at least wave, uh, running for the United States Congress. Matt Doheny, right over there. And Doug Hoffman is there somewhere. Where's Doug? Right there. And please join me in recognizing Holly DiTullio, who really got the ball rolling here tonight. Thank you, Doug. 
I have to know, uh, Jonathan Nelson is on vacation with his wife and his kids. That is an acceptable excuse, but we believe in family. Uh, and as Holly mentioned, the Tea Party movement here in the North Country has grown by leaps and bounds. We are in the process of appointing town and county coordinators throughout the 23rd Congressional District. And in the weeks and months to come, we'll be hosting organizational meetings in Watertown and Oswego. We've already been there once, actually, along with Malone, Messina, Augensburg, Saranac Lake, and Canton. Our goal is to have 1,000 volunteers at the ready by September of this year. That's 1,000 volunteers who can and will send a message to Washington. And that's 1,000 volunteers who will most definitely send a message to our congressman, Mr. Owens, your tax and spend days are over. We are the people, and we will be heard. You know, of course, that our congressman voted in favor of the health care bill, which in addition to imposing more than a half trillion dollars in new taxes, also forces each of us to buy health in a health insurance policy that meets the new federal requirements. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about one provision in the bill, which says that the IRS is responsible for enforcing this law. Well, last week, the commissioner of the IRS finally spoke up, and there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is, if you refuse to comply with this new law, the IRS will charge you a penalty of up to 2% of your annual income. The good news is, they're not yet allowed to seize your personal assets. Instead, and this is according to the IRS commissioner, he said that if you don't pay the penalty, the IRS will simply deduct that amount from your tax refund. Now isn't that just special? I mean, think about this. The government takes more money out of your paycheck than they're supposed to. You have to spend hours and hours of your time, and perhaps hundreds and hundreds of your dollars, filing your tax return so you can get the money back that they shouldn't have gotten in the first place. And then just when you think you're home free, some bureaucrat in Washington decides that your personal decision about your family's health insurance is not acceptable to them, and you don't get your refund after all. Communism. We're here tonight because all of us pay too much in taxes. In fact, for the average American, you may not know this, Tax Freedom Day was last week on April 9th. According to the Tax Foundation, the average American was forced to work from January 1st until April 9th just to earn enough money to pay all of the federal, state, and local taxes that you and I will pay this year. If you had a job. But you know, our friends in Washington, they're not content with just taxing people like you and me. They also like to tax businesses. Did you know, for example, that companies who manufacture or import drugs will be taxed an additional $16 billion as a result of this new health care bill? Did you know that health insurance companies will be taxed an additional $47 billion as a result of this health insurance bill? And here's my favorite. Did you know that companies who manufacture or import medical devices, everything from bedpans, to the stents that they put into your arteries to unclog your arteries, those companies will pay an additional $29 billion in excise taxes. Now, I want your opinion on this. By a show of hands, is there anybody out there that really believes that the drug manufacturers, the health insurance companies, and the medical device makers are going to take this hit and pay all those taxes out of their own profits instead of passing the cost? Does anybody believe that? How about this? By applause, how about how many of you think that most of these companies are either going to raise their prices or start laying people off rather than take the hit themselves? Clap your hands. Well, you're absolutely right. Just last week, Medtron, one of the largest manufacturers of medical devices in the country, announced that the new health care bill will cost them more than $336 million dollars and they're talking about laying off 1,000 people. This is Washington's idea of improving our health care system. This is Bill Owens' version of job creation and economic development. And ladies and gentlemen, this is why the American Tea Party was born. This is why the American Tea Party movement is here to stay. This is why American taxpayers like you and I are mad as hell. And this is why we're not going to take it anymore. I wonder sometimes 
if the people in Washington haven't taken complete leave of their senses? Would you like to know, for example, where some of the $838 billion in stimulus money has thus far been spent? You should be saying no, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I brought with me a very short list of my favorites. 219,000, this is according to the Syracuse Daily Irons, $219,000 to study the sex lives of female college freshmen at Syracuse University. That's your stimulus money at work. Here's one of my favorites, $3.4 million for a turtle tunnel in Florida. Because the first one wasn't working, the turtles didn't like it. And my all-time favorite, not a lot of money, but it tells you where we're going with our taxpayers' dollars, $15,551 to study drunk mice. I'm, I'm serious. This is in the Orlando Sentinel, the rodent study at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton to pay for two summer research to, to help gauge how alcohol affects a mouse motor's motor function. And they say that the Tea Party people are crazy. <laughs> I wonder sometimes if the people in Washington uh, understand any of this. One more example. Years ago, thanks to the Community Reinvestment Act, thanks to Bill Clinton, thanks to his HUD secretary, Andrew Cuomo, and thanks to a handful of greedy banks, tens of thousands of people who could barely afford to make ends meet were encouraged to buy their first home with no down payment, no interest payments, and in some cases, not even a principal payment. The result was a housing bubble which we all knew would burst sooner or later. Hundreds of thousands of people who lost their homes. We kick-started one of the worst recessions in our nation's history, and now there are more than four million people who are behind in their mortgage payments. Is this what you and I voted for? No. Is this what we deserve from our elected officials in Washington? No. Are you going to be happy with more of the same? No. You know, ladies and gentlemen, now is not the time to stay at home and trust that someone else is going to fix the problems we face. Now is not the time to assume that everything's going to work out and that sooner or later we're going to come out of this recession. And now is not the time to assume that the people we've been sending to Washington for the past 25 years are suddenly going to come to their senses and stop the spending spree that has brought this country to the verge of bankruptcy. You realize, I hope, that last year's race for Congress in the New York 23rd did a lot more than simply capture a few headlines. New York 23 captured the hearts and the minds of people all across America. People who, like you and me, decided that enough is enough. It's time to step up, it's time to speak up, and it's time to be heard. Ladies and gentlemen, now is the time to act. Our country is in trouble. Our values are under attack, and too many of our fellow citizens are sleepwalking their way toward a social and financial Armageddon. You know, the great writer Dante once said, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. My friends, we no longer have the luxury of neutrality. We no longer have the option of apathy. It is our duty and responsibility to pick up where the Tea Partiers left off. Their struggle to live free of a government which taxed them oppressively is now our struggle. Their struggle to live free of a government which interfered with every aspect of their lives is now our struggle. And while more than a quarter of a century separates today, today's Tea Party patriots from yesterday's Revolutionary War Tea Party patriots, make no mistake, we fight for the same cause, we fight for the same freedom, and we do it in a struggle which is no less worthy. And while our forefathers fought for their nation's independence with bullets and bayonets, you and I, we fight for the rebirth of our great nation with our voices and with our votes. And yes, with a solemn prayer that God Almighty will once again look with favor on a small band of freedom-loving patriots and give us the wisdom and the courage to preserve and protect for our children and our children their unalienable right 
to life, to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you very much. For Party chairman for the county of Clinton, and I'm going to Frank, out him. Frank, 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 excuse me. Don Leo I'm going to. I'm going to out you. Can you hear me on this thing? My clerk already. I'm going to out him. He's also a not so secret supporter of the upstate New York Tea Party, Jim Ellis. sure how I was going to address you, but my dear right-wing extremist friends. <laughs> I want you to throw your Bibles out and come out with your hands up. I mean, this is how dumb it is. It's really dumb. And it's I think that's what we have to do. We have to, we have to laugh at the situation that we've allowed ourselves to get into. I'm the grandson of immigrants on both sides. They came here because there was opportunity here. I asked my grandmother, who I was lucky and fortunate to have until I was 42 years old. Um, she died in 1984. And one day I said to her, Grandma, a lot of questions, things like, do you think in Arabic first and then in English? And she, you know, she thought about it. She said, oh, no, I do this, I do that. Okay, fine. Grandma, you just had a note from your sister in Lebanon. Do you ever wish you could go back there? She said, not on your life. I said, oh, that's great. I said, why wouldn't you want to go back? She said, why would anybody ever want to go back to a country that would take people like me and consign them forever. I'm, I'm making it a little fancier than she said it, but consign them forever to tending sheep on the side of a mountain. When Grandma died, she had 28 grandchildren, I being the oldest. Her great claim to fame was within three minutes she would tell somebody she had two dozen grandsons. That was her, that was her big claim to fame. <laughs> she couldn't read or write, but all 28 of her, of her grandchildren when she died had either completed college with a four-year degree, or we're in the process of completing college. That is what our country means to an immigrant community like ours. I'm here tonight because I want to introduce to you a star. I found a star. People call me nuts, and I accept that. They called me nuts when we said we should have John Faso as a Republican candidate for governor. I accepted that. But we also engineered a great victory that day for the little guys. Even though we were told that we had to vote or should have voted for another person whose name escapes me at the present moment, but he was a former governor of Massachusetts. We said, no. When they told us we should have a state chairman, other than the ones that Don Lee and I and uh, Ron Jackson and a few others got together to support, we said, no, we're choosing our own. And then the biggest nutcase of them all was when seven of us, not of the nine vice chairmen of the state of New York, reached across the aisle and said, to a Democrat from Suffolk County, their county executive, would you consider running on our ticket for the governorship of New York State? It took us about seven weeks to convince him that we'd love to be able to do business with him, but he had to become a Republican because that's the way he really acted. And I'm gonna let you I'm, I'm gonna let you listen to his story because he is the grandchild of immigrants also. And 
I just love traveling with this guy. I brought him here tonight. I spent a lot of time in the car with him. I spent a lot of time in the car with his wife. And by the way, you know that old story, that old joke about, wow, you aren't going to believe who's driving this guy around. I had a retired Supreme Court judge driving us around because I knew that if we got stopped, well, I won't go any further than that. <laughs> Jan Blumador over here is our, is our retired Supreme Court judge from Franklin County and uh, was the, how would you say it, about the second ranking or third ranking judge in New York State and a friend of mine ever since we were, ever since we were little guys throwing footballs at each other. So he drove us up here tonight and it's a pleasure for me to be able to bring to you the next governor of the state of New York, the next Republican candidate for the state of New York, because of what you have done with the Tea Party movement to bring the Republican Party back to the roots that it lost, to the direction that it lost. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the County Executive of Suffolk County, Steve Woody. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll tell you, this is an incredible honor for me. But first, I, I love these wonderful introductions. But uh, boy, with that kind of buildup, now I have to live up to that. That is too much, Jim. Thank you very much. And after these amazing speeches prior to me, uh, puts the pressure on. But um, I feel very much at home with this crowd because you are fighting for the same things I'm fighting for now, and I've been fighting for for the six and a half years that I've been a county executive in the largest suburban community in New York State. Um, but I want to tell you first off why I'm running for governor. There was a poll a couple of months ago. It was one of those polls of who you going to support for governor and a whole bunch of other positions. But there was a question that was thrown in within that poll. And many of you might remember this. They asked in the poll, with all of the shenanigans that have been occurring in Albany for the last year and a half, have you ever, during the last year, felt embarrassed to call yourself a New Yorker? Remember that poll? You know what was amazing about the results? A majority of the respondents said, yeah, I've been embarrassed to call myself a New Yorker over the last year. And I said, and long as that, and I said, gosh darn it, I'm going to run for governor so that I can have my children and your children and all the folks in this room and 19 million people in this state feel proud to be New Yorkers once again. I look out around this room and I see a whole lot of folks who look just like many of the Tea Party folks throughout the state and what you find in these rooms are a mixed group in a sense that some have been very much politically involved for a very long time. Some for half of their lives, maybe all of their lives, but a whole lot of others within that group have really just been motivated to get politically involved of late. Uh, they weren't long-term activists, but something has happened over the last several months, couple of years, that has instilled within so many Americans, within so many New Yorkers, a sense of anxiety, a sense of frustration, and I would say actually a sense of fear. There's a sense amongst many of us that we're losing control of our government. We're losing control as to what kind of lives our children would have. Perhaps this may be the first generation where our children will not have it better than the previous generation. And yeah, that instills fear within a parent. When you look at what's been going on in New York State with the lapses in ethics and the fact that we are inches away from fiscal insolvency, and that will spark people to get involved. And when I was sitting at my home with my wife a couple of months ago when we were pondering whether to make this run. It was really my wife, Colleen, who's with me here today. She said, you have to do this. Because I looked around at the field, and I saw that there wasn't anyone in this field 
who is an executive, who is a manager, someone who has taken budgets in disarray and turning them into surpluses. Uh, that's been my story. I started off in 1986 as this freshman legislator and I uh, gotten involved. Uh, my dad, who was a small business owner, had always told me, you stick up for the little guy. You stick up for that working class, middle class, hard working store owner or guy working his tail off. You protect them. So I got involved and in my first year in office I saw both Democrats and Republicans alike, but they, it was no different. They were spending money like drunken sailors, folks. And the tax increases that they were imposing upon those working class and middle class people were killing them. It was the worst thing you could do to them. And I listened to my dad's words, and my dad passed away just four months into my first term. And I dedicated my political career to my, to my dad's words and protecting those folks. And I knew the best way to protect them was to prevent these taxes from running them off of my Long Island and running them out of this state. And in the very first year, I was faced with a county executive and a legislature that illegally pierced our spending cap. And I said, you can't do that. And they turned around to me, these uh, salty seasoned veterans, and they said, hey kid, what are you going to do about it? Sue us? And I said, yeah, I'm going to sue you. And I did. And I won. And we returned $33 million. And then I went 14 years later after being deputy presiding officer and chairman of Ways and Means and garnering this reputation as a fiscal hawk, more fiscal conservative than any Republican on that, on that panel, I'll tell you. It didn't matter. It was all about the principles. I go to Albany, and I find very quickly that the public employee unions and the special interests control that place from top to bottom. And I saw, I saw these, these, these archaic and Byzantine laws being put into effect by the lobbyists who were writing these bills for, for legislators, giving us crazy laws. I mean, something like mandatory arbitration to the Taylor Law that I kid you not has now given us law enforcement officials in Suffolk County making $200,000 a year. And I was one to stand up in that whole chamber and say no. And some people said, you're crazy to stand up alone. I said, I'm not standing up alone. I'm standing up with a whole lot of taxpayers are out there saying, have a backbone and do what you think is right. We've got... You know, only in New York can you have these crazy laws that are written by these public employee unions and these, and these special interests that say, if you're an employee, and you fall off your chair and work, you stay home, you collect 100% salary, tax-free, you get more staying home than if you do go to work. It's crazy. It happens in New York. It doesn't happen in any other places. We've got to change that. Yeah. We've got, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, I ran for county executive in my county of 1.5 million, a county that's bigger than 11 states, with a budget of 2.6 billion with a B. 10,000 employees because the guys before me ran it into the ground. I inherited a county that is in, in, in a way analogous to what we're facing right now in the state of New York. Fiscal disarray. And they told me when I took office, congratulations, here's the keys to your office, and by the way, you have a $238 million deficit, good luck. <laughs> and they said, you know, the pundits out there said, you can't solve this without a major tax increase or major dislocation of services, draconian cuts. And I said, you watch us. And I rolled up my sleeves and I gathered myself around some of the best professionals, regardless of their political affiliation. I wanted people to ask what they knew and not who they knew in with me sitting around that conference table. And I'll tell you what we did to erase that deficit. We did the opposite of what uh, our friends in Washington did this past month. We took our HMO and we sold it off to the private sector and we saved a fortune. Let me tell you, that's the first thing we did. <laughs> then we shrunk the size of government through early retirements and attrition, and I didn't fill the positions back. And guess what? The buses still ran on time, and the, and the health centers stayed open. There's so much fat, there was so much excess in that government. I brought it down, and we're doing just as well. We're doing more with less. And then I did something that was unheard of in my county. I extracted $36 million from our public employee unions. Now why is it that 
in Albany, the governor, in the midst of the worst recession since the Great Depression, has still not received a dime in concessions. I mean, you have a private sector right now that is crying, they're hurting, they're in pain, people are losing their jobs. If they still have their job, they're getting no raises, they're losing their benefits, and then you have this public sector class where nothing was asked of them. Why? Because those are the same special interests that prop up the campaigns of those embedded incumbents. Well, someone has to say, let's stick up for the taxpayer every once in a while. So I told our unions, look, I don't want to lay anybody off, but if you don't sit at the table and do your fair share, I'm going to lay people off. And they might have thought I was kidding. I said, I'm not kidding. I've got a backbone. I put layoffs in my budget. But you know what? I didn't have to lay off anyone. You know why? Because they knew I meant what I said. And they came to that table, and they gave very reasonable concessions. I got what I needed for my tax base. No one was laid off. And despite losing $100 million in sales tax revenues because of this recession, I had a budget without a tax increase in this very difficult time. You can do it. I proved it. You can do it. years in a row thereafter without a general fund tax increase. While the state of New York was increasing spending by 70% over a 10-year period, I was cutting spending in my budget the last two years and three out of the last six years in my county. We got six bond rating increases from Moody's and Standard and Poor's over that time to the highest level in our county's history. Why? Because we followed basic general accounting principles. We didn't spend what we didn't have. You know what the problem is in Albany right now? They have this mentality, especially the liberal uh, assembly, where they first look to see, what do we want to spend on? And then they look to find the money to spend for. What I do, what you do with your business, what you do with your family checkbook, is the first question you ask is, how much money do we have coming in? And from there you decide what we're going to spend on. That's why you need spending caps in government. Right. Because they force you to spend on. So when I look at this state, this great empire state, on the cusp of fiscal insolvency, I say, how did this happen? Because there's no sense of fiscal discipline, there's no leadership, and these special interests and, and public employee unions run the state, and we need someone with backbone, with executive experience to say, we're going to start running this like a business, folks, and we can do it. But let me tell you how it's going to happen. There's only one way it's going to happen. Somebody has to run on that platform, and it has to be a very specific platform. You have to get a mandate from the people for change. That's where you come in. Okay. Ronald Reagan got it. By the way, Ronald Reagan, I kind of use him as a, a model in this sense. You know, I was a Democrat. Ronald Reagan was a Democrat. Ronald Reagan became a Republican at 51. I became a Republican at 50. I got him beat by a year, okay? And he had a pretty darn good career as a Republican, I'll have you know. But it was no surprise to the people in, in my area that I officially made the change, and that's because I've been governing as a conservative Republican for the last eight years, and that's why when I ran for re-election, I received the endorsement of the Republican and conservative parties, because they couldn't get to the right of me uh, on these fiscal matters, and it made a difference. And now we have to make that same kind of difference in Albany, and that gets back to how we do it. If someone wants to run for governor this year, folks, and they won't tell you what their plan is to save us from bankruptcy, tell them they need not apply. I don't really care what that you're running because you want to serve. I know you don't care either. I don't really care because you want to run us because what your last name is. I don't, want, I don't want to hear that you want to run because you think it's your time. You know, over in Massachusetts, there were some folks who said, it's the Kennedy seat. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and the public said, hey, I hate to tell you, it's the people's seat. Don't tell us who's going to win this race. Don't coronate anyone. We'll tell you who'll win that election in November. And a big surprise. Well, it's the same thing here. 
Before I came into this race, people were talking about this gubernatorial election as being a fait accompli. It was a coronation, all ready to happen. Well, they're not saying that anymore. You know why? Because they know, the pundits out there know, that people are fed up, they're scared, they're angry, and there's one thing they care about this election. Who has the skill set and who has the plan to save this state from bankruptcy? And if you think, as a gubernatorial candidate, you're going to just be, be, be able to waltz around from county to county and town to town doing photo ops without getting into the nitty gritty to give a specific plan as to what you're going to do to change the state, forget about it. It's not going to happen. Now, all of the operatives told me, don't lay out a specific plan. It's dangerous. That's not the way you do it. Because if you do that, you give opposition a reason to pick you apart. Well, they told that to Newt Gingrich as well back in 1994 when they put together a contract for America. And it was the right thing to do. Because what they said is, here's our platform. Here's our 10 points. We want to cure this deficit. We want welfare reform. And we want all these other things. If you don't like it, that's OK. Vote against us. But if you want a choice, you're going to get a choice. People got a choice, and they voted for it. Ronald Reagan got it. When he ran, he ran on a mandate. He said, I want to make people proud of their country again, and I want to cut taxes and stimulate the economy. And he won. And when he did win, he had a mandate. He had the public wins behind him. And remember, that was important because he was up against a democratically controlled Congress. How did he overcome Tip O'Neill in that Congress? He went to the people, the people responded, and change was made. And the same thing is going to happen in 2011, in January 1. <laughs> I'm not going to go on much for longer because I know you all want to talk about other things and engage in a little dialogue here, but I want to give you just a little sampling of what my contract for New York is all about and why I'm so high on it and why it's generating so much electricity and people are excited about it as well. The first thing I'm going to do when I'm done is declare a fiscal state of emergency in New York. And that is going to, that is going to enable us to open up these contracts, and to start from scratch, tear that place down brick by brick and start all over again. Yeah. Doing something along the lines of what Chris Christie's doing in New Jersey, okay? Yeah. That is what you have to do in New York State. We are going to take all of those fiscal restraints and all of those budget cutting resolutions that have been talked about for 10 years but swept under the rug, we're going to put them in one bill. We're going to call it our bill to save New York. And every set of eyes in this state are going to be focused on that one vote. And you're either going to vote yes to save New York, or you're going to vote no and allow us to go into bankruptcy. If you want to talk about accountability, that's the way you get Shelley Silver and the Democrats in the Assembly to vote for these reforms. One vote, up or down, to change this state. And what are we going to put in there? I'll tell you what we're going to put in there. We're going to put in a first spending cap in the history of the state of New York. We're going to put in a real property tax cap on the local level here in the state of New York. And let me tell you why that's so important. Because I pay a whole lot of taxes down in Suffolk County. I pay more taxes in absolute terms than you do. But hear me out. You look at the top ten uh, counties throughout the state as far as high taxes. You'll find Westchester and Nassau. Okay? But... Look at the list of the highest paid, highest paying counties for property taxes relative to your property value. You know where they are? Right here in upstate New York. That's why you're hurting so bad. Okay? I pay more absolute taxes than you do. You pay higher proportionally. That's where the pain comes in. That's why we need that cap. You know why that cap is so important? Star is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Okay? But star, just like the lot lottery. It was sold to be a reduction in your taxes. Well, it never did reduce your taxes. Why? Because there's no cap on the spending. If you had that cap on which, in fairness to Governor Pataki, he wanted it, in fairness to the Republicans, they wanted it. It was Shelley Silver who stopped it, and the Democrats in the Assembly way before my time, okay? Had they had the cap in place, what would happen is every dollar you got from Star, it would have been a dollar for dollar reduction 
in your property taxes. But without the cap, what happens? Well, the school is going to increase taxes by 5 or 6%. Hey, look, we got all this extra money. Well, we increased spending by 8 or 9%. We got the extra money. It lost that. Same thing with the lottery, right? It was going to be the savings. It didn't save anything. It was just more money into the pot to spend. you got to have the cap. We're going to get it under my leadership. You know what else we're going to do? <laughs> We're going to bring back development to the upstate region, and we're going to do it to the private sector, and the way we're going to make that happen is by waiving capital gains tax for investors who will invest in upstate New York. We have, we have venture capitalists in this state who will spread their money in Silicon Valley and all the parts of this, this great nation. Why not incentivize them to put their money, invest their money in New York, especially upstate New York? Wave the tax. I had some people say, you can't do that. We're going to lose the money. What money? We weren't going to get any money anyway. <laughs> Wave the money. Give people jobs and you'll see the filtering down effect. It's amazing. I know. I brought 2,000 jobs into my county with Cannon's North American headquarters right in Suffolk County. I gave them a tax break. The amount of money we got back as a result, it's worth it. <laughs> Tremendous amount of economic boom to our area by being friendly to business. It's an important thing to do. So, we're going to have a property tax cap. We're going to have a spending cap. We're going to waive the capital gains. And someone has to have the guts to say, this pension system can't go on as it is. It's going to close, okay? Now, now, you know what? If you're getting the pension now, and you grandfathered in, and that was a contract with you, and we're not going to change that, okay? But, yeah, big sorry would be there for some of these stuff. <laughs> but for the incoming folk, you can't handle this anymore. You know, you can't have a system anymore where you put in $60,000 and you're taking out $1.4 million. It, it doesn't happen. You know, so what we're going to do under my plan for the incoming employees, it's going to be the same as a private plan, 401k. You know, you put in a little bit as the, as the employee, the employer matches it, and then it grows with the market. Only in New York. Do we guarantee and backstop an 8% return even if the market is tanking? That's in the public sector. That's because of the public employee union. We're going to stop that. Again, not for the people who signed up already. That's your deal. But for new, if somebody did this 20 years ago, we wouldn't be in the mess we are today. But someone has to have the guts to say that, folks. And people say, the funds say, don't do that. Baloney, don't do that. You know why I'm doing it? Those special interest public employees... They're not supporting me anyway. They're not voting for me. They're voting for the other guy. They're voting for Cuomo, okay? That's the way it is. I'm going for the 80% tax credit in the middle. That's the way we're going to live. That's the way we're going to live. And the most, the most important thing is when you have a contract for New York, people now have a choice. When I'm on that Deus in the debate, and the fellow on the other end is asked, you know, what is your background with cutting taxes? There's nothing he can really say. I can talk about having taken a county bigger than 11 states, taken a record deficit, making it into a surplus six years in a row with no tax increases, having uh, the highest bond rating in our county's history, cutting, spending three out of six years, and the other end, you know, you might hear something like, well, I ran HUD, and you know what happened there, right? <laughs> then they're going to ask, then they're going to ask, so what's your plan? And then on the other side, you're going to hear, well, we're going to weed out waste fraud abuse. Heard that one before, right? Okay. And people are going to say, come on, give me a break. We want to hear a plan. And then I'm going to talk about my contract for America. Get a contract for New York, getting rid of mandatory arbitration, getting rid of the Triborough Amendment, for those of you who don't know what it is, only in New York, again, in the, pro in the, private, in the public sector, after the contract expires, you still get automatic step increases. It's crazy. It doesn't happen anywhere else. We're going to change this pension system. We're going to have caps on spending. We're going to waive the capital gains. We're going to do so many things. And I'll tell you what else. We'll never again in the history of New York State have a late budget. And you know why? Because we're going to do the same thing our counties and our towns do. You ever hear of a county or a town having a late budget? No. no. Why? Because they have a very simple rule. The executive puts in the budget. The legislature has two months to change it. If they don't do it by the time the buzzer goes off, then the executive's budget takes effect, or last year's budget takes effect. End of story. That's the way it's going to be under Steve Levy's administration, okay? No more six months for no budget.
specifics, when you have that kind of list that gives people a choice, now you've motivated people. They get off their chair and they get out and work for that ticket. You've motivated those people to get out and vote. That's what makes the difference. And I'm going to need a Senate with me. I'm going to need an assembly with me. I can't do it alone. And we're this close to taking back the Senate. And with the right guy at the head of the ticket, when this is a competitive race, we're going to win back that Senate. And I need 51. That's the magic number in the assembly. 51. That means when I veto all those spending increases from the assembly, I need 51 assembly members, Republican assembly members, to sustain my veto. Then we control the state. And that's when we'll finally get control over this crazy amount of taxation. I'm going to conclude with this. I'm worried to the extent that I don't like where we are with this state financially. But I'm still an optimist at heart. Mostly because that's what America is all about. When we face these kind of crises, we always take matters into our own hands and resolve it. We're incredibly resilient as a nation. You know, it's the whole history of this nation that is built on that persistence, that perseverance, that resilience. I mean, we came over from parts far away in these rickety ships where many of the people didn't even make the trip over because they perished along the way. Then we had folks who were uh, having their crops destroyed and they could have given up, but they didn't. The American way kept them going forward. Then we fought a revolution and saw tremendous pain but we persevered. Then we fought a civil war, brother against brother, but we persevered. Then we fought a world war and another world war, fighting Nazism. We fought totalitarianism in the form of communism. Now we're facing another scourge in Islamic terrorism, but at every step along the way, we persevere. We take control of our country in this type of a grassroots fashion. This is democracy in its purest and best sense. This Tea Party movement, you should be very, very proud of being part of it. And don't let anyone out there try to shame you, try to look their nose down on you. We're proud patriots. We're proud Americans. We're proudly going to fight to take our country back. We're going to take our state back. And never again. Will our children have to say that they're not proud to be New Yorkers? God bless you. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to tell you to be New Yorkers next November. God bless you. candidate for governor to reach out to the upstate New York Tea Party, which makes him a brilliant man. <laughs> <laughs> On the way in the door, um, we presented Steve with uh, one of our first upstate New York Tea Party pipe pins. Pipe pins, if you haven't got one, they're out there. Um, and my friend tonight, you earned that pen. Thank oh, you very much. <laughs> Now, we've got an extra microphone here, so I'm going to wander down the aisle there about halfway through, and for those of you that have a question for Mr. Levy, we'd like to get it asked. Now, I'm not going to suggest to anyone that Tea Party people have a tendency to ask long questions, <laughs> or to make long statements before they ask the question, but some of us do. I'm one of them. So I would ask, if you come to the microphone, that you ask your question as, uh, as clearly and as succinctly as you can. Unless you're a candidate, in which case we'll get you up here and you can go on and on and on when you're ready. So, uh, are you going to handle that? Okay, well, Oliver's going to volunteer to do that. He's stronger than I am. Why don't you go about halfway down the aisle, Oliver? And, uh, and just wind right up there. While he's doing that, I'm going to get in a few commercials. Anybody wants to ask a question, just slide it behind Oliver. I want to remind you, we've got some survey forms out there tonight. We'd like you to fill them out and turn them in on your way out. We also have uh, a referral form. 
I mentioned earlier that we're looking for up to 1,000 members by uh, September. We are more than halfway there. If a half of you were to fill out that referral form and give us the name of two neighbors, two friends, two relatives, and we could use your name to solicit them, we would very quickly reach our goal of 1,000. So please take that sheet home with you. Give us the names, addresses, emails, and phone numbers of two of your friends or family members or relatives, and we will literally double in size, perhaps even before the end of this month. The other commercial I'm going to make, we've got a long line here, is our next big event will more than likely be a great big tea party on the 4th of July. No politicians, just families, picnic, patriotic music, and a few speeches. So keep the 4th of July open. It'll be somewhere in Plattsburgh, and I think uh, we're going to do uh, uh, Jonathan uh, proud uh, and make it even bigger and better than his. Okay, we'll go to our first question. I think it's Judy Ford. Mr. Levy, get back up here. It's time to work. <laughs> Hi, Judy. Steve, please. I live in the Adirondack Mountains. I don't know if you're familiar Very with much. that area. Yep. And when you speak of great things for Upper New York State, my heart beats fast. And I think how wonderful that can be, but not for us, not for us in the Adirondacks. We live under a very oppressive park agency. Mm -hmm. question. Um, it's the APA, yeah. Like very difficult. It's a state agency that regulates our private land and our private lives in the worst way that you can Amen. Imagine. Amen. Yeah. Amen. When you have this great hope for the North Country, don't forget about us in the other I won't, ma'am, and let, let me tell you, I'm aware of that. And what you have here is a situation of oftentimes, you know, uh, a liberal from outside of your area dictating to you how you're going to live your life. Now, I come from an area, Long Island, which is a very environmentally sensitive area. You know, we're concerned about our bays, we're concerned about our drinking water. Uh, we derive a billion dollars from our tourist industry, so we can't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. We're very, very sensitive about that. We preserve our farmland, we buy open space, but there has to be balance. You also need economic development so you can expand your tax base and our young kids can have a career upon which to take root in the community. Now, it's all about balance. What's happened here is you have outsiders coming in and telling you with this condescending attitude, you can't control your own zoning because you're going to wreck your own home community. Excuse me? You know, people have lived up here for generation after generation after generation. They know better than anyone else, and they have more at stake in preserving their environment than anyone else. So, you know, you want development, but you're not going to do it in a foolish way. Get out of the way, all of you outsiders, and let the people from the area use the type of balance that we've used in Suffolk County. That's the key word. It's balance. Preservation is a nice thing, but to have these outsiders come in and tell you what you can and cannot do with your land, it's over the line, and I'll support you on that. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the North Country. Thank um, you very much. Uh, I grew up in the South, and uh, but in uh, the special day, unfortunately, September 11, 2001, I realized how much of a New Yorker I had become because all of a sudden I saw that those guys had attacked my state. And having grown up in the South, that was quite a revelation for myself. We were all Americans. Right. Uh, we were all Americans, and, and I, I'm proud to say now that I'm a New Yorker, and uh, I'm concerned for our state as well. I was wondering specifically, I think the greatest asset of New Yorkers, and this is from somebody from outside of New York, are New Yorkers. Okay, it's not, the Adirondacks are awesome, but it's the New Yorkers that make this. What is your view on protecting the life of future New Yorkers when it comes to abortion? And if you are somewhere where it's at some point you believe it's okay and then at another point it's not, could you please articulate why that line is defined where it is? Well, yeah, uh, my, my record is consistent, you know, it, it's clear from way back. I'm pro-choice but against partial birth abortion. Uh, it's pretty much the same as uh, my, uh, the, the other person in the Republican primary, so we kind of cancel out in that, and then it comes down to the uh, economic issues. But uh, socially in general, I tend to be a moderate. Uh, for instance, I'm a believer in the Second Amendment. I believe that people have a right to 
bear arms, to uh, protect their families. I'm a friend of the sportsmen. Uh, but by the same token, I voted for reasonable waiting periods and uh, background checks. But bottom line is I'm pro-Second Amendment. So I take a more moderate approach on these things. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's something that is, 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 uh, puts us in a position for electability uh, throughout this state. And again, this is one of those years where the fiscal matters are really going to be overriding because people are very, very concerned about their pocketbook issues. I'll, I'll just say this. I think we have a lot of uh, unanimity here uh, on, on the issue of fiscal matters, uh, but uh, Ed Koch, who was the mayor of New York for quite some time, this guy at Midas might have, might have said it like this, he had this great phrase, he said, you know, if you agree with me 75% of the time, vote for me, and if you agree with me 100% of the time, see a psychologist. And it's pretty good advice. So I don't think we're going to agree on every single thing, uh, but on core principles, are we there? And the biggest principle this year is going to be saving the state from bankruptcy. And um, you know, hopefully, uh, we'll be united on that. Hi, Steve. Tony Maliotti. Um, um, you know, the state seems to have a, a spending problem, not a taxing problem. Right? I mean, I think. Uh, since the uh, last administration, spending has gone up about $25 billion, if I'm correct. Um, one of the biggest cost drivers I see is, is the fact that, uh, um, for instance, uh, a local school district um, uh, is, is going to spend about $10 million on a, on a renovation project after they already spent $7 million not long ago. And uh, part of that $10 million, $3.5 million is, is going to be going to, to, to uh, redo your roofing, or put up a new roof. Now, I'm in private industry, and I've already priced it out that we can build a whole new uh, 60,000 square foot manufacturing facility for three and a half million dollars. So, why is it that it cost, in, the, in the government sector, in the public sector, it costs probably seven, eight, ten times what it should cost? So, can you address what the, why is it that we spend so much money on public projects where in the private sector they can do it much cheaper? It's all the rules, the regulations, the oversight, the environmental laws that have to be uh, run by and over and over and over. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example, another example of where uh, private sector does it better. And I'm in a big battle with my legislature right now. We have a, uh, a public nursing home, okay? We lose about $7 million a year on this nursing home, in large part because of the rules and regulations on the public sector that are so burdensome that aren't on the private sector, we have to pay because of these mandated contracts far more in benefits, far more in pension, far more in salaries to our employees than the private sector. We have these charitable nursing homes that can come in and take over our nursing home in a nanosecond and save my taxpayers seven million dollars. I'm trying to sell this. 250 employee union in that, in that nursing home has stopped me cold because my legislators won't support me. But that's a case where I can save them $7 million in a swoop. And I'm trying to do it because I'm not concerned about the political flack for doing it. But the point is anything you do in the public sector is going to be more expensive than what you do in the private sector because the public sector doesn't have a bottom line. In the public sector, they feel no matter how high the cost goes, they can just come right back around like a big Ponzi scheme and get more money out of the taxpayers. Where if it's a business, you're out of business if you don't balance your books and watch every single penny. And it's just inherent in the system, which is why I'm such a fiscal hawk and I like to privatize and create these private-public partnerships. So there's no easy answer to that, Tony, other than it's inherent in the public sector system with all the regulations, with all the extra benefits, with everything that's been handed into these costs because of the public sector unions and just the crazy Byzantine type of laws that we have in the state. You need someone at the helm who's more business friendly. We don't have it right now. The way I helped grow my economy in Suffolk County, keep taxes under control, was by expanding the tax base. And you have to make it friendly for business to operate here because public sector just doesn't get it right. Simple as that.
my name is Audrey Lawrence, and I've lived up here for about a year and a half. Before that, I lived in Suffolk County, and I followed Mr. Levy's career quite closely. Everything he says is true. Oh, thank you. I didn't know where that was going. Okay. <laughs> than any other Suffolk County executive had in years. So what he says is true. And remember that when you go to vote. Oh, thanks. And she's not on the table. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Is that your brother? Yeah, no, I said no. Yeah, I'm not. Good evening, sir. Dennis Dovrosso. Hi, Dennis. Steve. Could you be uh, specific about any particular state agencies such as the APA that you would be looking to shut down or severely curtail? And yeah, unrelated. Yeah. On second Commissioner of Corrections, but I'll tell you that about that. Okay, and, and an unrelated question here. Another, you already mentioned Second Amendment. Could you tell me where you might go with that in the sense that as a, neither as an active nor a retired federal law enforcement officer, I cannot get a concealed carry permit in this state. That's atrocious. Active law enforcement officer with a badge walked in. No, you can't have one. Uh, so I, I thought I always thought it was easier in the rural areas to get it oh, sure. down in the southern part. Oh, thank you. So that's uh, very interesting. Uh, but well, I'm sorry, what was the first part of your? Uh, agency. Yeah, oh, let me yeah. try. Yeah, agency is a perfect, example. perfect example. The COC, Commission on Corrections. What a disaster! Mm -hmm. You can't make this stuff up. The state of New York and the COC is closing down three prisons upstate, at the same time, they're forcing local governments such as mine to spend a billion dollars in constructing new jails. I mean, you cannot make this stuff up. And my, I just put out a press release today saying, keep the jails upstate open and absolve me of the mandate of having to spend $250 million to a new jail. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, so many other counties around the state, Livingston and Allegheny, and they're being forced to pay for the biggest capital works projects in the history of their county with these jails where the local government doesn't get a cent of reimbursement from the state or federal government. You have excess capacity upstate, okay? Keep the jobs there, work out a deal where we can take some of our excess and bring them up and I don't have to build a jail and you keep the employment going over here. That makes sense, but the Commission of Correction doesn't care. They just say, we're unaccountable, we're an authority, we can do whatever we want and we can close down your jail and make you pay unsufferable amount of damages if you don't follow our mandate. First thing we're going to do is twist that agency upside down and inside out. So I can tell you that. And there's many other Two more questions, please. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Levy, I would, uh, I'm on local government. I'm on town board. And when you start talking about uh, capping taxes, you know, and property taxes and stuff, it concerns you when you're doing budgets. Yeah, and one of the things that concerns me is, the, uh, are you going to also cap mandates so uh, that our taxes don't keep going up? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, believe me, if there's anyone who knows what the crushing impact of mandates uh, are, it's, it's a county executive from a county, and we can commiserate on that. The biggest mandate of all, of all folks is Medicaid. Medicaid in this state is bigger, it's more expensive than get I'm not making this up either bigger than Texas, Florida, and Carolina combined. Let me say that again. Medicaid in New York State spends more than Texas, Carolina, and Florida combined. And I'll tell you why. Because the federal government has a minimum threshold that you have to, that you have to expend for your, your poor in health care, okay? And a lot of people blame the feds, and there's a lot of blame to go around with feds, okay? But if we just live with the federal guidelines, our taxes and our Medicaid system would be far lower than what it is today. But in New York State, they built in everything to their own standard, which means we have coverage for mental health, for chiropractic, for fertility, and all these other options that really don't exist in other places. Now, what does that mean? If you're from a town or a county like myself, here we are the only state, one of only two states, excuse me, in the nation, where the Fed picks up 50%. And then the state picks up 25, but then the local government picks up the other 25, and that's a killer. 
We had some years back in the early 2000s where our Medicaid was increasing at a clip of like 17% a year. They were, I'm talking, in my county alone, $50 million in increase, increases that we had to come up with in Medicaid. Okay? Fortunately, I, I led a group of about four legis uh, county executives in 2006 and capped it for the locals at about 3% growth a year. But here's the biggest problem. There's very little incentive for state legislators to change this system, and here's why. When they expand Medicaid, the people that are expanding to they get 100% of the credit, and they only have to have 25% of the skin in the game when it comes to the expenses. Now go the other way. You're now going to cut Medicaid, okay? You're getting 100% of the blame as a state representative, and you're only getting back 25% of it, okay? So they have very little incentive to get control over Medicaid. You know, my, if I get in there, I'm hoping that we would be able to uh, absolve our local governments over time from having to share in the Medicaid costs. And as the, the, the state has more skin in the game, they'll be more careful as to how they spend your money, I might say waste your money. So those mandates are crushing to us. It's not just Medicaid, it's in so many other areas. In our schools, for instance, I have a cousin who's a business director in a local school district. He tells me that of all the revenues in his school district, only 7% come from the state. Yet 70% of his time and that of his staff is dedicated to a dealing with the paperwork, the rules, and the regulations for that 7% that comprises his budget. This is crazy stuff. It's killing our local governments and our schools. Someone's got to put a stop to it. It's going to be at the top of my list. I promise you that. I used to work with government, so I kind of know the game and how it's played. New York State is top heavy in what I call pork barrel positions. There's a commissioner for this and a commissioner for a commissioner. These are all people who serve at the pleasure of the governor. Uh, COC being a good example, you don't even have to be a high school graduate. You can be a high school dropout and make over 100000 a year. Shouldn't somebody take a look at some of these positions and get rid of them? They're not necessary. They really are not necessary. You need people with experience, with information, with a degree in something. Um, at least a high school diploma, okay? Um, can't you take a look at some of those as governor and we can't get rid of some? And let me tell you what the bigger problem is, even more so than those appointed by the governor, is the authorities. We have authorities in this state that are monsters, and they're unaccountable. These authorities, whether it's the MTA, the Port Authority, and all these others, they have the ability to tax, and they're not elected by anyone. They have the ability to build an administration without any restrictions whatsoever and pay anything they want. Now, even if you're a governor or a county executive or a town supervisor, you do things that are out of line, at least you're accountable to the public, and they'll take your butt right out of office. But we've created these behemoths of authorities that these guys can do whatever they want with no one really watching the store on these guys. It's incredible, unbridled power with no check or balance, and it's costing you a fortune that you don't realize how much of our economy is soaked by the waste within these authorities because there's no accountability. Accountability, folks, and this is my last word, it means everything. When our elected officials are allowed to do what they want in impunity, when you have a re-election clip in Albany, and I kid you not, that is higher than what the Politburo used to be in the old Soviet Union, when you have a re-election clip in our state legislature where people leave office more through indictment than getting thrown out of office by the voters. We've got a problem in this state, okay? So accountability is important. If you are not satisfied, and I know the folks in this room are not, stay motivated. Please stay motivated. It's a long way off till November, but we're going to make a difference. We saw it in 2009, and let me tell you, I think ain't seen nothing yet, but it's going to happen, it's going to crescendo in 2010. Motivated voters will make the difference. This 
grassroots, democratic with a small d, democratic with a small d movement, is going to change America. And it's going to be more responsible than any single individual or any entity out there in changing the state, radically changing this state forever. As long as you keep your officials accountable, we'll be able to take our state back and again make ourselves proud. So thank you very much for your time. Mind will absorb no more than the sea will endure. I think you've endured enough. Just a quick commercial. We try to pay as we go. There's a very attractive young lady out the door with a basket in hand. If you can kick in a dollar or two to help pay for this room, we want to remind you about the surveys and the referral forms. Thank you very much on behalf of the Upstate New York Tea Party. Stay with us. <laughs>